What's going on, friends? Harley Davidson is a company that is deeply rooted in tradition. So, as we all know, they're not very quick to make changes, nor are they quick to fix their mistakes. Well, or even admit their mistakes. So, for sure the price you pay for a Harley Davidson, you really expect you're getting premium engineering, as it is considered a premium brand of motorcycle, and they do command a premium price. Well, they don't always get their engineering right, and they often make some pretty bad mistakes that take a while to get these mistakes corrected, which often Harley-Davidson doesn't fix them for many, many years, which leaves the door wide open for the aftermarket to come in and save the day. Guys, please don't forget if you enjoy the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Now the first engineering folly for Harley-Davidson on my list today is one that's very widely known and that is the cam chain tensioners on the 88s. So we went from the Evo that was stone cold reliable, really didn't have a lot of problems and then first thing on this new 88 motor, guys are buying them, people are rolling some miles on them and then all of a sudden we start losing oil pumps, engines start shelling and there's really no explanation, really no warning sign or anything of leading up to this. Now there's a lot of debate on the twin cams chain tensioners. Was it the spring tensioner putting too much tension on the shoe itself? Was it the material that the shoe was made of? Or was it the cam chains themselves that were like chainsaw chains? Nobody could ever really give you a definitive answer on what exactly caused it. Now as many of you are aware, Harley-Davidson had this tensioner system from 1999 all the way until 2006 and only in 2006 did they go with the hydraulic tensioners in the Dyna. But it wasn't until 2007 when the Touring and Softail lines actually got the hydraulic tensioner system. But long before Harley came out with the hydraulic tensioner system, it was actually Andrews cams that bailed them out. Yes, Andrews designed a cam plate with the hydraulic tensioners and then only after that were those tensioner systems offered basically through Screamin' Eagle with the billet cam plate. So for the guys that bought bikes between 99 and 2006 in that time period, really your only option was to go with Andrews. If it hadn't been for Andrews coming out with a new cam plate designed with the hydraulic tensioners and also using a better material for that hydraulic tensioner shoe, you would have been stuck with those spring tensioners for quite a long time with no other options until the factory actually started doing it on all their bikes in 2007. Now, the number two kind of bonehead mistake Harley made, 2007, everything went fuel injected. Love or hate fuel injection, it does have its plus and minuses to the carburetors, but one of the big complaints that happened in 2007 was you could no longer manually adjust your idle. Yes, you can adjust your idle on a fuel injected bike, but you have to do it through a flash tuner. Now, once again, aftermarket to the rescue on the fuel injected bikes. Harley Davidson uses an idle stepper motor, which actually controls the idle speed with the fuel injected bikes. Now you can eliminate that idle stepper motor and go with a manual adjuster in place of the idle stepper motor. Companies like Idle King and American Motors came up with a little thumb adjustment screw that goes in place of your idle stepper motor. These things are quick and easy to install couple bolts, pull the stepper motor out, you can put the manual adjuster in there, and you can actually turn your idle down a little bit to get a little lope out of your Harley. Now, although I will, I will say this, Harley-Davidson does recommend a minimum of 1,000 RPM, 900 at the bare minimum. This way you can maintain proper oil pressure while the bike is idling, and you're not basically starving your oils for parts at idle. And don't get me wrong, they sound really good when they're idled down really low, but I honestly wouldn't go down below 900 or you risk starving your engine for oil. At least your top end, anyhow. Number three on my list, where Harley-Davidson has failed us, but the aftermarket once again bailed us all out and Harley-Davidson had to catch up. This is with the compensator. Yes, once again, 2007, this is the year where the compensator issue started. Harley-Davidson basically carried over their compensator from the 88 to the 96 and then again in the 110 when all these engines came out in 2007. Now the compensator is very unique to Harley-Davidson as this basically levels out the engine pulses and everything from the irregular speed of the crankshaft before it runs down the primary. 
and they do this with a series of ramps and springs within the compensator. Well, the problem with the 96 and being sure the problem with the 110, the compensators they were putting on these, they just weren't up to the task of handling the added torque and horsepower that you got from the 96 and the 110. So between 2007 through about 2009, we saw a lot of compensator failure issues. But after 2009, they really kind of started to, I guess, wane a little bit as far as the issues go. But it wasn't exactly until 2011 when Harley-Davidson actually fixed the problem themselves when they started putting the Screamin' Eagle compensator in place of what was the OEM compensator. So in 2011, you're basically more or less getting a Screamin' Eagle compensator. But in between that time, we had companies like Baker and Dark Horse. They were coming out with their own design of compensators and also compensator eliminators. So definitely Harley-Davidson really should have thought through the whole compensator thing when moving from the 88 to the 96. And then they really should have thought it through on that 110. But as I discussed in previous videos, the Screamin' Eagle engine isn't all Screamin' Eagle parts. So it did have the OEM compensator. These are known to fail in these years, but like I say, if you're not having a problem with the compensator, I wouldn't worry about it until it actually starts to go out on you. Then you go ahead and change it before it gets too bad. Number four, where Harley has really let us down, is the cooling system on these bikes. Now, I love the look of the air-cooled engines, but Harley really hasn't done a whole lot to do any heat management on the bikes. They did introduce some like heat shields that go between your legs, to kind of help keep the heat off of you as a rider, but they never really addressed anything with the engine. Now, granted, you could argue they came out with twin cooling later on, but that's only on select models. Harley hasn't really offered anything for heat management as far as the engine goes. So once again, aftermarket steps in, and we have companies like Love Jugs, which they make some small fans that go on the side of the engine to help push some air across the motor. Now, granted, Harley is old technology with the air cooling, and let's face it, this is the 21st century. We have a lot more traffic these days, so we spend more time sitting in traffic than we do actually getting out on the open road and cruising, where we can actually keep these air-cooled motors down to a pretty decent temperature. Well, as decent as an air-cooled motor could be. But if you're riding in traffic, a good set of love jugs, this will help move some air across that engine and help cool it down. Now, Love Jugs does, does have the little micro ones. They look pretty decent on there. Now, Harley-Davidson has come out and tried to address some of the heat management issues, but mainly for the touring bikes with a little fan in there that's supposed to pull the heat, pull air across the motor and draw the heat out to the ground and dispel it. The only problem is, is heat rises, and if it's pulling that heat to the ground, it's chances are it's going to be coming right back up on top of you anyhow. So the number five dumb engineering move that Harley made. And this is a pretty simple one because this is at a time where they solved one problem and seemingly created another. So once again, 2007, we have the cam chain tensioner issue taken care of. We got the new hydraulic tensioners, all's good there. Well, Harley tried to do us a solid and come out with the automatic primary chain tensioner, which we discussed in the video last week. Now, the problem with the automatic primary chain tensioner is that this thing has one direction, and that's only to ratchet up tighter. So, as you ride the bike, the miles pile on, your chain does develop a lot more tight and loose spots in it. Now, you do have to have a bit of a degree in slack with that primary chain. Now, where this tensioner really makes things complicated is that it continues to ratchet up tighter and tighter in all the loose spots in the chain, leaving you with absolutely no slack in the chain. So once again, the aftermarket has to come in and bail them out. Now, Harley-Davidson does now offer a manual primary chain adjuster, but Hayden offers their spring adjuster. It's a spring-loaded primary chain adjuster, which, depending on how you have it set up, you got to get it set up right, or you're going to have a lot of deflection and too much slop in there. But you can shim the spring in there and basically get the tension rate set to where you're not getting a lot of slop, which in my opinion, kind of the spring-loaded shimmable tensioner is probably what Harley-Davidson should have done in the first place to allow for some slop in that chain and the tight and the loose spots as it runs around the sprockets. But anyhow guys, these are the top five things that have driven me crazy about Harley-Davidson and just some of the 
absolute what were you thinking engineering moments when they put these bikes together. Now don't get me wrong guys, I love Harley Davidson, I ride Harleys, but you know this is, to guys that ride Harleys, this is nothing new. We get this. I mean it's just kind of the nature of the beast and owning a Harley. I still love these bikes no matter what. I mean, granted, they're not just perfect right out of the box like some other foreign manufacturers may be, but hey, they're not perfect either. But anyhow, guys, please don't forget to drop a comment. I do want your thoughts on this. Did I miss anything? Are there any other bonehead engineering follies that Harley-Davidson has made on their bikes as of late? Let me know in the comments. But anyhow, guys, that's all I've got for you this week. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to drop a like on it. And if you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing to the channel. But anyhow, guys, until next week, please stay safe on the streets, dodge those cars, ride safe, and I'll catch you guys back here next week. Thanks for watching.